You're listening to Impulse to Innovation. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Mees. As a global community of mechanical engineers with over 120,000 members in 140 countries, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers has been at the heart of the engineering profession since 1847. The Institution's mission is to improve the world through engineering by sharing the latest news, views and insight into the creative world of technology and the people that make it happen. The ever-present challenges of climate change, over-reliance on limited resources and a global demand for new technologies is pushing the engineering community to find more innovative ways to design and manufacture products. Engineers and scientists working in the materials science sector have been exploring the properties of everyday materials such as metals, plastics and glass for centuries to identify new properties and behaviours which might enable us to conserve the world's finite resources. In today's episode, I talk with three leading experts in the field of metamaterials, engineered materials that have unique three-dimensional structures which cause them to behave in ways not found in nature. Their precise shape, geometry, size, orientation and arrangement give them smart properties capable of unconventional shape changes and the ability to manipulate electromagnetic waves, achieving benefits that go beyond what is possible with conventional materials. With incredible versatility and an innate sustainability built directly into their structures, metamaterials have the potential to be used in the electronics, communications, healthcare, aerospace, automotive and energy sectors. In today's episode, I speak with Dr. Claire Dancer, Associate Professor and Reader in Material Science and Metallurgy at WMG, University of Warwick, and Vice Chair of the Metamaterials Network. She is working on ceramic metamaterials and manufacturing processes. Dr. Callum Williams, Lecturer in Physics at the University of Exeter, is focusing on photonic and optical metamaterials and their surface properties, and Dr. Tom Allen, Fellow of the IMAC e and Senior Lecturer in Sports Technology at the Manchester Metropolitan University, is looking at how mechanical metamaterials can change athletes' performance. I started by asking Claire about the Metamaterials Network and how this community of interdisciplinary engineers and scientists came into being. Claire, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's it's a real pleasure to have you on. I I wanted to start by asking you about the UK Metamaterials Network, uh, which you are joint chair of. I I think that's correct, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, How how did that network come about and, and what is it focused on? So the network actually came about entirely from grassroots community building activities, which I think is a really nice way for a network to start. And I think it's part of why it's so successful, because it really has come from an initiation of the researchers and industrialists who were were originally engaged in mass materials activity. So a few years ago, um, there was a a short paper was written by some of my colleagues, um, led by Alistair Hibbins of Exeter, who's my who's my co-chair. Um, and they wrote a big idea document for the EPSRC. And that proposed that mess material technology, which originated in, in much of it originated in the UK, can't take all the credit, but John Pendry's seminal work really does build the, the bedrock of our, our research area. Yeah. Um, so the idea was that we would build on that and move towards more mess material products, more mess materials research, more of a mess material community in the UK where it, where it all began. And EPSRC liked this idea um, and encouraged an application for a network. The mess materials network was funded in 2020 and we got started with a relatively small group of people, mostly who'd been involved in the planning of the network and the there were town halls and meetings to sort of think about what might this network look like. Um, but we did start in the middle of COVID. Right. And that was very interesting for a network grant, which was largely funded to get people together in person and get us together yeah. and talking and, and exchanging views. So 
the early stages of the network mostly were built online through online sessions, online discussions, online roundtables, building those communities with lots of people who were a bit frustrated and stuck at home. <laughs> but actually, in some ways, I think that has contributed to the network's success in a very strange kind of way, because it was quite easy to have a light touch. Let's just see what this is all about. Let's just have a chat about, about some things online. I don't have to travel. I don't have to put all that into it. So the network, which has been running since uh, fully since 2021 or 2020, some events, 2021, uh, the network focuses on bringing people together in discussions, in forums, in an annual conference that we have where we gather about 120 people together in a hotel in, uh, in the countryside. And we, we all talk about Metapotils for a few days, which is a wonderful opportunity. So, so far, we've mostly been focusing on that. We're now transitioning into being what's called a Network Plus, and that gives us the opportunity to fund some projects. Right, okay. And that's a really exciting opportunity for us as a network because now we can start to move towards really shaping the research agenda, not just encouraging lots of people to apply for research grants, but actually issuing some research grants for our own. Yeah. Um, so we are really growing as a network. We're well over 700 people in the community now who've engaged and lots more people who've engaged with the network but not necessarily joined, um, especially people from overseas who perhaps the, the um, network doesn't doesn't serve their needs so much but they still engage with our events we have a nice program of online talks uh, we have a regular program of in-person events and lots of activity that's developed in metamaterials in the UK. It's It sounds incredibly exciting that you, even through a, a really difficult time for, for science and engineering, you've been able to bring this community together. And we'll, we'll make sure we put the details on the podcast notes so uh, people can get in touch if they're, if they're interested in, in joining the network. Hope that's okay. Yeah, definitely. We also have a YouTube channel, right. which has got lots of our online talks, which some of which are perhaps more technical and some are less technical, uh, but there's lots of great content there for people to engage with if they'd just like to find out a bit more about metamaterials and the, the science that we're doing in the UK. Yeah, definitely. We'll we'll share that with, with our listeners. Now, you have quite an active community of, of academics and researchers based all over the country and, as you've said, internationally as well. How does that community work together and what kinds of challenges are they focusing on at the moment? You talked about some of the funding that you're now able to offer. So wh where is that um, funding being focused? Mm. So we have moved from focusing primarily on particular areas of metamaterials. So metamaterial technology is quite universally applicable. Traditionally, the, the target functions were things like optics and yeah electromagnetics and microwaves and those kind of radio wave devices. As the field has evolved, it's been shown that metamaterial type approaches is actually more universally applicable than that. And you yeah. can apply it to acoustics, to mechanical metamaterials, to lots of different sort of functionalities that the approach is, is relevant to. So our community has been quite used to working together remotely, which has been advantageous, partly due to starting in COVID, I think. And we are very geographically spread. We have members from, you know, I have collaborations and, and partnerships that have grown partly from the network and partly from other activities, but from sort of St Andrews to Exeter. It's really, really broad spread across the country. Yeah. Um, and to do that, it's been partly about getting to know each other, getting to uh, meet at the occasional events where we do get to meet and exchange, you know, helpful information about our relative research areas. And what we've always tried to do is have quite a forward focus on the work we're doing to move metamaterials from where I think it really started, which is in the physics labs. In, in the physics yeah. labs where they were thinking about the fundamental physics of these materials, what can they do? What possibilities are there from the, these materials? Trying to move that more towards a question of what problems can we solve? What applications do these materials have? And the absolutely crucial question, especially for me, of how do we make them? <laughs> yeah. It's one thing to make something in your lab where you can glue it all together and get the duct tape out and, you know, you've, you've got something that functions as a device. It's a completely different challenge to move towards being able to manufacture that yeah. at all and manufacture it at scale, which is very, very critical for the products that will make it to market. So, 
that's one of the major challenges that we're working on as a community is manufacturing metamaterials. So I'm based in the Warwick Manufacturing Group at Warwick, so inevitable probably that I take a lead on manufacturing metamaterials in, a, sure, in our yeah. community. And what we're really trying to do from this sort of manufacturing standpoint is say, well, there are lots and lots of metamaterial designs in physics labs. Some of them can be manufactured. We need to do better at working out from an early stage how we can design for manufacturing, how we yeah. can think about that from an early stage. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Metamaterials often have a lot of internal structure. So they might be made of lots of different types of materials. There might be lots of holes and gaps, and those are systematic. that are needed in the design. But from a mechanical point of view, that actually makes them extremely likely to fall, to fall apart in use. Right, yeah. We have to think very, very carefully about how we actually manufacture that so it retains its function, it retains that unique design that has all these spatial variations and changes, but also can be made and manufactured and, importantly, doesn't fall apart the first time you try to use it. Yeah. So that's the sort of thing we sort of focus on, looking at how can we use different methods, how we can, can we... Yeah, you know, additive manufacturing is great for making metal materials, but it doesn't necessarily make them really, really strong. So how can we improve those techniques? How can we perhaps use some techniques that aren't additive, but are formative, that shape and form the structure instead of doing that additive approach that might give it more durability? So that's the sort of thing we're working on. The other area that we've moved with challenges is to look at the grand challenges, the big challenges that face all of us. And the ones where we've picked out that we think metamaterials could really have a big impact are sustainability, um, health, in a very broad sense of health, and space and aviation. And so as we move into being a network plus, and we're, we're funded till 2028, so we've got a, a great opportunity now to really work on these problems, we are looking to bring all different types of metamaterials into these challenges. So if you think about what could we need in space and aviation? We need sensing materials. We need materials to help with um, energy absorption. We need lightweight structures that can unfold and adapt to different conditions when they're up yeah. there. And all of those have to be extremely durable in that quite extreme environment. In health, again, you have mechanical problems that could be aided by metamaterials, sensing technologies, the scans and the, the visualisation of, of things in the body can be aided hugely by metamaterials because metamaterial lenses for example can be made to work for different wavelengths of light and adapt to different wavelengths so that it can you can get more scanning opportunities in one single device yeah. um, and in sustainability there's both the question of how do we make sure the new metamaterials we're making are sustainable often metamaterials are made out of more than one material type so there is a challenge there to ensuring that they're recyclable and reusable and, and durable and all of those, those things that we really must think about when we bring new products in. But also there's a lot of possibility for metamaterials to help with sustainable product manufacture. So perhaps adding a coating to a solar cell to increase its absorption efficiency, right. that can be a metamaterial. Making lightweight structures that do the same as something that's much heavier so for instance in acoustic mess materials an acoustic mess material that absorbs sound can be much much lighter because of the way it's designed than a traditional way of absorbing sound which is essentially let's put some really heavy rubber mats in place yeah. and make them mechanically absorb everything if you're using a mess material approach you can funnel the sound into a place where it gets absorbed that structure is inherently much, much lighter. And so from a sustainability point of view, if you're putting that acoustic mess material into, say, a vehicle, it's going to require less energy to run that vehicle because the weight is lower. So we think that those four challenge areas are the ones that are really key for mess materials to tackle. And we think that they offer an opportunity to take lots of different types of mess materials, mess material technologies, and people with different knowledge of different areas in mess materials and bring them together. And that's really what our network is all about, is bringing people together from different backgrounds to tackle these problems so that we get the best solution out at the end. So yeah, that's what we're working on. 
my, my mind is kind of reeling round as to the kinds of applications that that this could have. As as you rightly said, you know the, the opportunity to use it in space technology for for satellites and and all kinds of things, right through to healthcare sensors. This could really really change the way that the engineers not only use materials but but actually think about the opportunities for for being able to uh, extract even more data from a much more grand Mm. Um, you know, point of view. You, you were talking there about using it in, in acoustics, uh, and mm. that opportunity to tune it to to a particular wavelength. That sounds really exciting. Yeah, it is. I think it is really exciting. And my background is in material science, so that's where where I'm coming from with this. And I'm sure other people you talk to come from physics, and they have their their view on it. But my view on metal materials, from a material science perspective, is it's it's really the ultimate level of control. Wow. If we use a material and we think of the materials science and we think about materials engineering, there's always a, a limit to the properties a material can have. You, know, it, it, you might be able to control it a bit by altering little things about the microstructure and about the way you've, you've textured it or how you've processed it or what you use in the composite. Metal takes you a step beyond that. It enables you to to a much greater extent, dial in the properties you want. And if you don't have to compromise on the material properties, you have ultimately much more potential to make amazing things. So there are unique capabilities of best materials, and those are great and super important. But there's also this level of, for me, the much more general level of, we take materials and we can make them even better than they already are. It's the cherry on top of the cake. And that's a really exciting thing from a materials engineering perspective to have this additional design variable that we can use to be able to, uh, yeah, generate more properties out of the materials we already have and are already great. Yeah, it's an extra thing that, that you can add on. I, I'm I'm really excited. <laughs> it sounds wonderful, Claire. And I, I, let's let's kind of explore that a little bit because your particular area of research at Warwick is is looking at ceramic composites and and their yeah. manufacture. So you're working on a num with a number of industrial partners as well on this. And as you said, you're now at this kind of sort of I guess crossroads in that you want to take these from from being bench sort of proof of uh, principle now into actual real life manufacture and and uh, and use so what sort of applications uh, are you looking at at the moment uh, and how will your research evolve into kind mm. of technical solutions so we work across my my group works across a huge number of applications um and it's sometimes slightly baffling to me how we've come to, to work on such a range of applications. But fundamentally, what we're interested in is how do you make ceramics in an efficient way? Ceramics are a particularly problematic class of materials for processing. They require high temperatures to make them into dense, robust products that you can actually handle and use. Yeah. Because unlike metals and polymers, where they're primarily processed by melting them, and then casting them into the shape that you want. You can't really do that with ceramics because you have to go well above 2,000 degrees to melt any of them. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. instead, we do everything in the solid state and we rely on diffusion, which is much, much slower. Um, and that generally means to process the ceramic. And some people might have seen this on, on the Great Possibly Throwdown. If you haven't seen the Great Possibly Throwdown, go and watch. Um, we typically process ceramics by putting them in a very hot oven for a very long time. And that's about as energy intensive as it gets in industry the ceramics industry is a huge energy user so what my group has focused on pretty much since i came to warwick is how can we get those temperatures down but not compromise on the material properties and there's there's multiple motivations for doing that one of which is we shouldn't be using as much energy as we are it would be better if we could use less and that's fine but there is another problem with things like metamaterials and also other, other things like solid state batteries where you want the ceramic electrolyte in place. If you, and with metamaterials, it's the same. You want that ceramic in place, dense, fully processed. But you also want bits of metal in there and you want bits of polymer in there. And that causes problems because you can't process it all together at right, the temperature yeah. of the ceramic. So what we've been looking at doing is ha looking at ways that we can make things like electromagnetic microwave metamaterial lenses, for example, okay. which have a, a graded structure or change in properties. How can we process that all together? 
So we've looked at a number of ways to sort of drive this down. We've got some techniques that are, are developed in the lab and we primarily work with a company called Lucidium who are based in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, so we work with them on a technique called flash sintering where you focus all the energy into the sample instead of spreading it around in the furnace. And that's been a really productive uh, collaboration that we've had because what they want to do is scale their technology up. Right. What we want to do is understand how the processes work. So it sort of fits together. Uh, yeah. They need to understand how the processes work in order to scale it up and in order to push into new product areas. And they're a very interesting company because they're quite willing to come along with me on rides, like let's explore metamaterials, let's think about this, um, as well as sort of other, other areas. We also work quite a lot with um, end user companies, so companies who might use the products or the technology in the end. So one example of that at the moment is we're looking at how can we use recycled ceramic wastes to make high value products. And we're working with a company called um, Bellagio Stone on that, who are local to here. Okay. So they are looking at how can we reprocess some of their waste into a useful, useful product rather than just throwing it away. And all of those processes are basically targeting using these low energy manufacturing processes to make new and interesting materials that can be either for functional, amazing applications like metamaterials and like and like batteries, but also using the same technology to make structural ceramics for, for other um, more perhaps more everyday activities and, yeah. and applications that we might have. You're going well beyond uh, as you, you kind of touched on at the beginning well beyond the just the manufacture of these materials in the first place but you're actually pushing the boundaries of of how we process and how we dispose of the, mm. these technologies you know end of life use and and i mean that is a big area of discussion anyway for, for the engineering community yeah how yeah. do we dispose of this but there's a whole like circular economy mm. co conversation to be had around this isn't there so metamaterials yes. in themselves are actually spawning other uh, areas of of discussion around how we work as engineers as well which is fantastic i think that's right and i think it is something that is incredibly important i think we almost have responsibility as researchers actually to think about this in our research when we do it and i know that epsrc are encouraging this as well producing something that's impossible to recycle it's very ethically dubious for me now <laughs> yeah you know, it's, it's one thing if you if you make something it's not to say you can't have composite materials composite materials are incredibly valuable but if you think about what that composite is made up of best materials being a type of composite you know in most cases if you think about it at the start, how am I going to extract out these materials at the end? How am I going to make sure this doesn't just have to be disposed of because it can't be reprocessed? I think that's a valuable thing to do and an invaluable thing to, to embed in. So um, I have projects where, for instance, the, the project with Bellagio Stone, we've embedded in from this very, very early stage. We're on feasibility study level, very, very early stage. We're already doing supply chain analysis in LCA. Because it's that important that we make sure we're not making a bad solution to a problem. You know, we don't want to go down that path. So we're trying to find, you know, is this a reasonable thing, way to approach this problem from the very start? And in, in mess materials, the same. I can give examples of materials that have been made out of ceramic and metal. Those are great for recycling. They look awful. But you can heat the whole thing up and melt the metal away. Yeah. Recover the metal. You've got your ceramic. Ceramic's not had anything happen to it it looks the same as it did um but those materials are very recyclable in comparison to having a structure that's made out of two very similar polymers that you can't separate yeah that's a very difficult thing to to manage and to deal with so i think metamaterials gives us an opportunity to make better use of our resources and our materials but it also because it's a new technology gives us an opportunity to embed that sustainability in from this very early stage um, and, and then hopefully it will always be a hallmark of metamaterial products that they are recyclable and they are sustainable that would be my hope that i think that's that's a wonderful way to to focus on a, a, what is quite a, a new industry it really isn't it as a new subject mm. matter I, I think that's a, a fantastic way to think of it right from the very start and as you rightly pointed out it's key for engineers to think about those kind of things before we even start to use uh, a new material or, or 
build a new product or service. Uh, I, I think that's fantastic. So it's clear then that there are going to be wider benefits to society, not just in the use of the metamaterial to make things lighter and easier to use and so on, but but also in the disposal and end of, of life process as well. So mm. this sounds like a win-win for everyone. I hope so. I really hope so. I think it's metamaterials technologies and the metamaterial approach to using materials, I think is one of the most exciting concepts I've come across. And it's certainly... It's not an easy problem to solve, but as someone who's come from a materials background entirely, I really do see it as a, a paradigm shift in idea that we can structure materials in such a way, we can use our materials more efficiently, we can make sure that it's designed in, that they are sustainable. That's what, where, where we should be working as a community, and I think it's incredibly exciting. And, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of it. I feel very lucky, actually, to have been part of it. Um, but yeah, I hope more people will join us. And there's plenty in the metamaterials community for everyone. The idea might look a lot like it's very materials focused and, and there is a lot of material science and engineering in it. But there's also all the physics we need to understand and there's all the electrical engineering we need to understand. There's all the mechanical engineering we need to understand. It really is something that for me spans a huge remit across um, science and technology and um, everybody's very welcome in our network that's for sure <laughs> i think that is a wonderful uh, way to end this interview actually um <laughs> it, it, it sounds like this is a, a great opportunity for for engineers and scientists um not just now but in in many years to come uh, we'll make sure that we put the details of the network uh, so that people can get in touch if they're interested in either working with you or, or actually joining the network as well so claire thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your huge enthusiasm for this really interesting subject thank you great thank you helen helen thank you for joining me on the podcast today it's a really great pleasure to have you uh, i'm really fascinated by this subject it's, it's something i know nothing about pretty much in my introduction i mentioned that metamaterials are artificial materials that have electromagnetic properties that don't occur naturally, I guess, in their base materials or, or what makes them up. Now, your area of expertise is in photonic and optical materials. And that sounds really quite fascinating. So can you tell us a little bit about what photonic metamaterials are? So thank you very much, Helen. It's uh, lovely to, to be here uh, all the way from, from Exeter. Um, so yeah, so I, I work in photonic metamaterials, and uh, as you've as you've just uh, pointed out, uh, ph uh, photonic metamaterials are, are structured materials which have properties that that go beyond what nature can can actually provide. Yeah. They typically consist of little kind of micro and nanostructured arrays, uh, which then strongly interact with the uh, electromagnetic waves of of light. Okay. So um, say the uh, the glasses that you're wearing at the moment typically consist of uh, a borosilicate glass and in order to to change the way that they interact with light we typically need to uh, change their chemistry okay so we need to apply or, or add different materials say to the the glass in order to change its refractive index but we're typically limited to what nature can provide for us here and the kinds of materials that we add to it or alternatively, we can create structures that are many times smaller than the, the wavelength of light. And in combination, we can create a similar effect to what typical lenses do. So refract or reflect uh, light. And we can do that with kind of carefully designing these, these little structures. And these little structures are called photonic atoms or, or meta atoms. Right. And these are our building blocks to, to make a variety of different kinds of devices from lenses to filters to antennas to a, a, range, of different, uh, a range of different things. What you're talking about there is manipulating the structure of the material itself, aren't you? The, you you're almost trying to place the atoms within the structure of the material so you can get a certain behaviour. Is that kind of a, a simplified version of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, another another example that, that one might be familiar with is that, you know, a lot of people have seen, seen mirrors, right? So mirrors are, are typically made of, you know, silver or aluminium, and they look uh, very reflective. And that's yeah. the, the bulk material. 
But if we were to say, as, as you describe, kind of place little little parts of that material, so little parts of aluminium or little parts of silver or even gold, uh, you can you can make it look colourful. You can make it look red. You can make it look green, or you can make this look um, black. You can make it perfectly absorbing, all by just changing the the geometry, so the size and the shape of the of the of the same material. That's absolutely fascinating. So you can you can create all kinds of ways of manipulating the the light to go in different directions as well, can't you? Because I I did see a photograph that showed uh, a spoon in a a glass and uh, and it showed how I understood physics to work, that there was a slight offset of the the spoon as you look through the glass. But if you introduce some of these crystalline forms into, into that glass, you can make that refraction bend completely in the opposite direction, can't you? And just change the way that physics works kind of thing. Yeah. So this, this, is, this has led to this idea of negative refractive index. So um, you, you may be familiar with the concept of refractive index in, in general, um, and it typically kind of describes the, the way in which kind of light bends when it enters a material, like, like one's glasses or uh, a cup of water, and you see kind of light um, kind of bending in, in a particular direction. But if you had negative refractive index, then the light would bend um, in, in the opposite direction, yeah. uh, which is a very unusual and counterintuitive phenomenon. But it has been experimentally shown, and it has been shown typically at the, the longer wavelength. So in the electromagnetic spectrum, we go from, say, X-rays from, and then to, say, visible light all the way through to, say, microwaves and then um, kind of radar. Yeah. And they're all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in, in the, um, the case of negative refractive index, um, it's, you know, it's, it was initially demonstrated in the, in the microwave part of the, the spectrum. And now it's kind of slowly being slowly being shown in the the, the shorter wavelengths or towards the the visible part of the, the spectrum. Yeah. Now I did read that back in the nineties, sort of early two thousands, there was some work done to uh, prove the concept of an invisibility cloak. Uh, now we're not talking science fiction here. This is not Harry Potter kind of moment. This was a real proof of principle, wasn't it? That could have uses particularly in aviation and and the defence industry. Is this the kind of thing that we might see develop in the future? And what kinds of everyday technologies might we find metamaterials in? So yeah, so the the example that you you mentioned, the invisibility cloak, that was arguably the kind of the defining moment of the kind of the, the birth of metamaterials, let's let's say. Or in the um, in the 21st century, and that was work that was done by Professor Sir John uh, Pendry at Imperial College and uh, collaborators at Duke University, David Smith, right. and they um, experimentally demonstrated cloaking in the microwave part of the spectrum. So, kind of wavelengths that are the order of about one centimeter or so, kind of the the, the size of your your fingernail. Okay. And if you if you imagine, say, a um, a stone in a stream analogy. So let's say we wanted to cloak or, or hide a, a stone in a, a stream. Um, you, would, you would typically need to very smoothly guide the, the water around, say, the stone or, or the object and back to the kind of the other, not, not the other side, but the, um, the opposite side. Um, and downstream, you wouldn't notice that there was a, a stone in there um, at all. Right. So if you were to apply a similar concept to, to light, um, you need to slowly kind of guide or smoothly guide the light around the object rather than abrupt changes. And uh, that was that was achieved with these very small little uh, meta atoms, which uh, were carefully selected in order to to smoothly guide the light around the the object and uh, to the um, to the opposite side. So that was a, a wonderful demonstration. And um, ever since then, people have been trying to create. You know, a range of different, say, devices based on that idea, and also to uh, demonstrate this at shorter wavelengths, so into the so the infrared and, and the visible. In terms of the applications for, for that, I mean, the kind of the defense industry are arguably the um, the most important sector when it comes to say yeah. cloaking and kind of stealth activities. Uh, it typically just becomes quite quite difficult to manufacture these types of materials at a large scale. Or the mass manufacture of these these materials, uh, but still there has there has been great great interest from the the defence side. Not not just cloaking, but say the reduction of radar cross sections or yeah. say mimicking cross sections of other other objects. But that that opened the door essentially into this area for other researchers to to, to use these kinds of ideas to. 
um, to build upon to, to create a, a range of other types of technologies and new kinds of antennas through to new kinds of sensors uh, and a variety of other kind of application areas. So that initial idea then, I, I'm guessing it was in in some kind of uh, paint or surface preparation. Would, would that be the kind of way that it would be transferred onto the material uh, or, or the object like a, like a tank or a, an aeroplane or something like that? Is that how you would find this metamaterial from that point of view? So, so in the, um, I mean, that would be, that would be brilliant if, if one could do that and, and take right, some, okay. <laughs> some, some paint, say a bucket of paint, and instead of painting camouflage, you would, you would paint a metamaterial onto a, onto a surface. That would be, that would be wonderful. Yeah. The, um, the original demonstration was with printed circuit boards, oh, right. you know, in your, in your, your smartphone or your, um, your electronic technologies that you, you have in your, your, your room there. Uh, they would consist of printed circuit boards. So typically a bit of a bit of plastic with some some metal components on there, and this this was this um, this was done in a, lots of concentric circles um, type arrangement where you had these printed circuit boards with these metallic components that were um, kind of printed atop of yeah. them, and that that works in the the microwave part of the spectrum, whereby your the, your your wavelength of interest here is sufficiently large such that the resolution of a of a printed circuit board or the 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 objects on a printed circuit board are, are far below that wavelength, yeah. but it becomes a little bit more difficult to to make these structures at, at different parts of the the spectrum, and typically the shorter the shorter wavelengths. The paint idea, yeah, that would be that would be brilliant. Oh well, I you know uh, I'll I'll give you that one for free. Thank you very much. <laughs> You. We uh, we definitely need to see something like that, I suppose. Although I can see disguising buildings and all kinds of things could become quite difficult if we had aeroplanes or drones or things flying about and couldn't see what was in front of them. So that that's quite an interesting issue that I guess engineers would have to overcome. But, but the idea of being able to disguise uh, electronic systems and, as you said, uh, sensors or antenna, I guess for the for the aviation and, and defence industry will be something that that they'd be very very interested to see. So hopefully maybe we'll we'll see something like that coming out in in the next or few not years. see or not see. Oh, no. <laughs> very very clever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, I have we a definitely will as not a see it. <laughs> <laughs> on the on, I mean on the topic of ap- applications, I mean even even from a um, an energy harvesting standpoint. Or an or a sustainability standpoint as well. The idea of trying to say cut say the thermal kind of wavelengths that are entering buildings, for example, letting some in, letting some out. This this idea of absorbing certain parts of the spectrum is just kind of want to emphasise the applicability, not just in the defence sector, but the energy sector through to kind of healthcare, etc. There's mm. there's a variety of applications that are kind of beyond that of um, uh, defence and, and stealth. Yeah, and from a healthcare point of view, that could be really quite useful, uh, particularly in a hospital environment where you've got huge amounts of electronic equipment and devices uh, that could potentially be affected by uh, other signals. Being able to maybe pass these uh, signals around each other would be a useful a useful tool. So, Callum, we, we've covered some of the fundamentals uh, of what photonic materials are but but what kind of applications do these materials have and and what what's the work that you're doing uh, at Exeter because I'm quite interested to hear more about that yeah so um, the application space of metamaterials is is vast and it's kind of growing growing by the year I would say from I mean from my personal standpoint metamaterials um, and, and the area in, in general, is a is a design framework which allows us to think about kind of device engineering from a different standpoint. We don't yeah. now think of which you know materials are available to us and how can we kind of use them. We think about well, what's the desired property that we want? Yeah. So, do we want say energy in a different part of the room or different part of the uh, the sky or something like that, or to concentrate it in a particular um, part of the the device. What structures do we need to make in order to to do that? So it's effectively this design framework that's then applied to you know lots of different sectors. So yeah. for example, in in the healthcare sector, you know, as a big push to minimally invasive imaging, and one of the the kind of the hurdles to say very very kind of thin endoscopes, for example, or um, imaging devices that fit within the the human body the kind of the bulky uh, optics that exist yeah. um, kind of at the, the tip of one of these these scopes 
And um, the use of metamaterials can can drastically shrink the size of these these optics. So instead of having kind of a big bulky refractive lens, you know, we can make a meta lens that's, you know, much, much thinner and much, much lighter. Also within, say, the healthcare sector, when it comes to, say, sensing and, and biosensing, if we were to put molecules atop of these, top of these structures, we can change the resonant properties. And dependent on the, the actual molecule that sits upon these structures and the design of the structure, the, the output response will change. So, it, you know, it's not, it's not just within, say, um, say the defense industry, but you know, healthcare is one, one example and communications with antennas and, and, um, and otherwise. Um, for, for me, down at the University of, of Exeter, so I'm, I'm interested in photonic metasurfaces. So we talk about metamaterials, which are three-dimensional. So you have structure um, and structural changes within three dimensions. I'm interested in the 2D equivalent of that. Okay. So it really is on a, on a surface level. So we have structures on a, uh, on a surface. And um, the advantage of, of, of that is that they become much more straightforward to, to manufacture. So we can make these, these meta services relatively straightforwardly within a nanofabrication clean room environment here within the, the University of Exeter. Um, where we use something called electron beam lithography to to define these these little structures, so it, it, it allows us to 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 make these these devices in a in a much more simple simple way. So I, I'm interested in using these meta services in order to build new kinds of say multifunctional uh, imaging and um, sensing devices from the the visible part of the spectrum through to the the um, mid wave infrared. Wow. I mean, that sounds incredible. So what, what sort of things are you looking to, to use these surfaces for? Because there, there must be, uh, I mean, we've talked about healthcare particularly, but what, what other areas uh, would you be applying those kind of uh, meta surfaces to? Yeah, so um, within the, the kind of the, the imaging and, and sensing space, what I am particularly interested in is firstly kind of the the exploration of these little structures and how to design kind of the the best structures for a particular application, but also the ability to manipulate all the different properties of light. So we haven't talked about, say, polarization. Uh, we haven't talked about manipulating the wavelength of, of, of the light as well. So for, for me, it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating to be able to, say, control the polarization properties and the kind of the effect of color of light to be able to use um, kind of these meta surfaces for little um, little filters let's say in front of in front of cameras okay. in order to differentiate between say different different objects um, so if we were to say image an object that is you know that has a certain uh, spectral signature uh, we can use these say meta surface filters to differentiate between the two objects um, from a sensing standpoint as well, uh, interested in new kinds of kind of compact and cost effective biosensors, right. whereby having, say, if, if, if you were to, to have not just say one meta surface, uh, one meta surface, but a, uh, a variety of different kinds of meta surface all on the same chip, if we were to have a some sort of um, molecule that was was spin coated atop of this this surface, uh, or variety of different molecules that were um, spin coated upon this surface, the actual meta surface sensor itself would be able to say read out what uh, molecule it was and the concentration of that that molecule. So to to do kind of biosensing in a in a in a different way than um, than what we're used to. Okay, just going back to what you were saying there about being able to look at objects and allowing different forms of light through the surface. Is that something that you would you would think of using for? Uh, say space telescopes or or something like that, where you are looking deep into space and and collecting very small amounts of light to be able to to kind of enhance images. It, is that the kind of direction then that this sort of technology is going in? Uh, that's I would say that's one particular route. And uh, using the the James Webb Telescope as an example, so the James Webb Telescope, you know, which is producing absolutely stunning images at the moment at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum yeah. uses a um, uses a filter wheel to differentiate between all the different different wave bands so it has this kind of big bulky filter wheel that rotates around and consists of these little little discs or, or, or filters which then kind of overlaps with the the sensor and then you you know one takes an, an image 
um, at a particular wavelength. Right. And the, the say the draw with uh, a meta surface approach, even a, um, a tunable meta surface approach, is to try and kind of scrap that filter wheel and to have a, a single element or, 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 or smaller elements which are able to mimic that functionality um, through the kind of the, um, the structure rather than these kind of um, bulky filters. Right. I'm guessing then that the, the opportunity, and you, you mentioned it slightly before, is, is that we're going to be able to, to shrink down a lot of what we would call electromechanical devices, you know, like the James Webb, to much smaller constructions because these surfaces will have multiple finishes to them and we'll be able to see much more with, with a smaller device that that sounds like it's going to make the engineering community get very excited if they're going to be able to make things a lot smaller than they would have done in the past uh, potentially yes i think the the excitement is 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 definitely on the um you know the size weight reduction yeah. um but it, it's also the the increase in the functionality as well yeah so it's you know it's not just mimicking the same performance of a um of a lens or a, or, or or a single filter in in one kind of compact form factor it's the ability to say multiplex different functionalities within a, a compact form factor as well, or, or have have new functionality that you know we we were we were limited to do in the in the past. But the short the, the, the short answer is is yes. There's a um, there is a, a, a drive towards say using uh, meta materials and meta services in order to dramatically reduce the the size and the weight of uh, a variety of different uh, electromagnetic um, devices. The challenge comes with the manufacturer or the mass manufacturer because a lot of the demonstrations are, are typically done over the small areas uh, or small small volumes and the ability to, to produce the length scales that are required to do this within say the visible or, or infrared part of the the spectrum is, is is typically quite quite costly to do even over small areas so that the challenge comes from a manufacturing point of view in my opinion yeah i, I was going to pick up on that actually the 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 issue of manufacturing something at scale to not only reduce cost but but make it accessible to a, a wide number of uh, industrial sectors sounds like it's the next big challenge it sounds like you, you you've got the the principle of these materials down but now the next stage is going to be getting the engineering community to really look at how we can make this on a larger scale yeah and I, I would say um, some some examples of that or some promising examples of that are uh, adopting some of the strategies in the, the electronics industry. So the a mass manufacture of electronic circuits has been, the, the similar techniques have been have been used to make meta services. And the, the challenge comes that that's, that's okay for, for large volumes, but small, small areas. Right. So for example, if you wanted to make something the size of a um, electronics chip, but lots of them, then that, that works. But to make something that would say, you know, cover the entirety of a, of a window or, you know, something similar. So very large areas and large volumes, it becomes uh, a little bit more, uh, more complex. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the manufacturing challenge is, um, is quite, um, quite, quite important at, at this stage. Yeah. Well, I hope that some of our listeners are, are hearing this and, seeing some opportunities here to to really look at the the manufacturing process behind this and and uh, and see how we can get these incredible materials to to market in a, a shorter time scale uh, it, it sounds an incredible area I, I would love to come and see down at Exeter what what you're actually doing it sounds really exciting particularly from my point of view in healthcare so Callum thank you very much for joining me on today's show I really appreciate it thank you thank you very much Alan and you're, you're welcome in Exeter anytime <laughs> that's great thank you Tom as always, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Your interest is in mechanical metamaterials. So I suppose my first question has to be, what is a mechanical metamaterial and how does that differ from, say, Callum's photonic applications? So the main thing of a mechanical metamaterial and the difference between what, what Callum works with is, as the name suggests, it's more about traditional mechanical engineering. So think about traditional materials that a mechanical engineer would work with, more sort of structural mechanics. That's the side that the mechanical metamaterials are on. And what we do is rather than thinking of a material in the traditional sense, 
where we may just have a block of material and that has set mechanical properties. We take the material and we might structure it in a certain way, which gives it unique and unusual properties, okay. which we cannot obtain with the base material on its own. And we can vary that structure in different places and have these unusual and enhanced properties. So rather than looking at the sort of the the bending of light waves and things that, that Callum is looking at, you're looking at actually manipulating f- physical, the sort of stuff I would understand as a mechanical engineer, physical blocks of material. It, exactly. So my work is much more aligned to traditional mechanical engineering. What so, so physical objects and products and, you know, things like that. Okay. And what sort of materials are you actually using from that point of view? Because my, my first thought is metals, but are you using sort of polymers and other things as well? Yeah, so there's di- different materials that, that can be used. So as I said before, rather than taking a material to having a block of that material, we shape it in, in a certain way to give it specific properties. So we could take a metal and shape it in certain ways, but we could also take a polymer or a composite or a foam and it's just really about taking the material and shaping it in a certain way to give it a set structure quite often it is polymers and quite often we would make them particularly in the university using using 3d printing right okay i i came across a a word while i was kind of researching this subject for for the podcast and i'm really curious about it what does Oxetic, have I pronounced that right? Oxetic yep, materials? Yep, yep, yep. What does oxetic materials mean? And how does that differ from m- materials we use in everyday engineering? So, so an oxetic material is a, is a subset of the wider field of mechanical metamaterials. Right. And an oxetic material has an, a negative Poisson's ratio. Oh, okay. So Poisson's ratio is related to how a material behaves when you pull it or compress it, how it expands in, in the opposite direction or contracts. Yeah. So a normal material, think of an elastic band, when we pull it, it gets thinner. Yeah. Whereas an oxetic material, counterintuitively, when we pull it, it actually expands and gets fatter. Okay. Equally, when we compress it, rather than getting wider, it, it gets thinner, so it contracts inwards. When we compress. So it's counterintuitive, and that's the negative Poisson's ratio. So engineers who are familiar with Poisson's ratio, it isn't just in the positive regime, it's also in the negative regime. And that is what we call an oxetic material. So that can lead to enhanced properties, increased indentation resistance, synclastic curvature, so it will form a dome shape when we bend it. And it's not necessarily about saying that we're always championing an oxetic material, but it allows us to think of Poisson's ratio from the negative to the positive regime rather than just thinking of it in the the positive. That, that's really fascinating because when we're taught as engineers or when we're students, we're not taught really about it being a negative or a positive number. It's it's just Poisson's ratio. So so this opens a whole new opportunity then, I guess, for, for engineers like yourself who are interested in applying this in, in different ways. If we can not only create the material in, in different structures to begin with, but, but give it these incredible properties that we wouldn't ordinarily think about. It, it, Exactly. So, we, so we're traditionally taught, you know, Poisson's ratio is, is positive, but that isn't necessarily the case. Some, sometimes, you know, it's negative. And also, we're taught it's a constant, and that isn't true either. Right. I mean, in the simplest case, it's a constant. But when we have a material, often the more we pull it, we get a change in the Poisson's ratio, depending on how much we're stretching and how much we're, we're compressing. So, so it isn't just a constant. Just like Young's modulus, you know, at low yeah. low strains, we consider it to be constant. But as soon as we go to you know higher strain regimes, it te- it actually tends towards towards zero often. How, in terms of your research, which is in sports technology, and and you're you're particularly interested in, in the way that these materials can be used to improve performance and and reduce the risk of injury which you talk about actually in, in the recent report where we, we spoke uh, last year about the, the report that you've done on, on the role of engineering in sport, which is called Sustainable, Inclusive, Innovative, The Role of Engineering in Sport. It's a policy report you co-authored with uh, members of the IMACE last year. You are looking to integrate these materials into sports equipment. Is that right? So what kind of improvements are you seeing in terms of performance if you're replacing traditional materials with these oxetic or uh, meta materials yeah so, so so we feel that there is great potential to bring 
metamaterials, particularly mechanical metamaterials, into the into the sports arena and to really revolutionise and, and enhance um, sports equipment. That is already being done. There's some, some commercial companies that, that are doing this already. You know, we see 3D printed structures in the soles of running shoes, protective equipment, and. As I was saying before, rather than taking a material in a traditional sense and saying this material has this property, this material has this property, we say, well, we can take this material and we can go away from the base properties and we can structure it in a certain way to give an unusual or enhanced property. So we can make it so maybe it conforms and fits to the human body better. So you could have body armor which fits to the fits to the body better. It could have very high indentation resistance. So quite often with protective equipment in sports, what you don't want is lots of very bulky, heavy, sort of cumbersome equipment because yeah. then people don't wear it. So if we have a material which is very soft and flexible in normal use, but has very high indentation resistance, it can actually be very light, you know, kind of non-bulky, easy to wear. But if you do fall onto a rock or something like that when you're skiing or snowboarding or mountain biking, it will offer that indentation resistance and, and protect you. That, that that makes me think very much of like non-Newtonian fluids, that sort of... <laughs> it, 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 it's soft and squishy if you if you press it gently, but as soon as it hits something hard, it goes rigid, and it, it's the same sort of behaviour, isn't it? Exactly, and that can be argued that that is a form of mechanical metamaterial. So imagine if you take that non-Newtonian structure and then structure that in a certain way. So rather than just a non-Newtonian material, you're linking that in with the, the structure of the metamaterial. So it could be very soft and flexible at low strain rates, and when you compress it fast at high strain rates you can have a combination of the structural properties and the non-newtonian properties coming together and giving some really sort of interesting enhanced properties and what we're thinking about is going right to the extremes that you can achieve with these with these materials and what comes to my mind as well is that that kind of application goes way beyond sport as well doesn't it you you, you could uh, in, incorporate that into um into a car for example for crash crash testing I and mean, there are all kinds of a- applications even outside of what you're doing all, all different applications from sport to healthcare to transport there's loads and loads of different applications and what we tend to do is we we work in sport because it's a great test bed it's a great demonstrator it's relatively low barriers to entry it's really good to gauge the sort of public um, appeal and opinion and people can see and it raises awareness sports equipment is mass produced so it allows us to really test production lines get the companies and the factories familiar with working with these materials and then once we've demonstrated them and tested them there we can move them across into into other other areas so, so sport is a great sort of test arena and, and proving ground yeah the conversation I had with Claire was uh, really about the the wider implications of this technology it's not just actually making the material in the first place but but how people are going to interact with it and also the manufacturing processes that will go into it at, at scale uh, are going to be quite complex I suppose initially so you're picking an area of, of sports technology which is going to give you an already existing manufacturing platform I guess that you can integrate these materials into. Exactly. And the thing with sports equipment relative to other products is it is really mass produced. You know, millions and millions of tennis rackets, shoes, bikes are are made every year. So if you can integrate it there and get the production lines working, then you can get the factories and the industry familiar with the the concepts and the ideas. Yeah. Now, I spoke with Claire earlier about the, the the issues of sustainability and sustainability being a major topic of conversation across all industry aspects and and the you know the big global drive to conserve our resources. What impact will metamaterials have when it it comes to tackling these kind of issues and and what are you hoping that a mechanical metamaterials uh, will achieve in in the coming years? So I think that mechanical metamaterials will really help us contribute to reducing and sort of enhancing sustainability. So just to think of an example, something like a sports shoe, um, or there's lots of different components which tend to be glued together, bonded together. You've got different materials. So at the end of the life, it's quite hard to, to recycle because you have to yeah. take all those different things apart and get them back. Imagine a metamaterial where you just have one material, so one polymer, which is shaped in different structures and different regions, allowing you to obtain the different properties without getting different materials and components and gluing or bonding them together. So so the, the sole of the shoe 
could could be the same material as the midsole, but just transitioning to a different structure and then transitioning to the upper. So when it comes to recycling that shoe, you can just grind it up and completely remake it. So I think metamaterials will allow us to reduce the number of parts and components and to simplify things down. That sounds really exciting. I mean, I never even considered that in a single object that you could make those kind of transitions, uh, the opportunity to then make, I guess, um, bespoke uh, solutions uh, for for people, uh, particularly in the sports industry, would be would be quite a driver for you. Yeah. So, so if you make bespoke equipment, which which works better for the person, which is more durable, longer lasting, all of these things will contribute to sustainability. So, yeah, by by really being able to tune and vary the properties, tailor them from one region to another whilst using the same material is is really really beneficial. So, we should be able to simplify the number of components and number of materials within products across different products we could maybe start using the same materials to make it easier to to recycle between different products and also just basically just reducing the amount of different materials that that we're using things like you know color options and things like that can all contribute to to increase kind of environmental impact because if you're if you're making a product you know, molding it in one plastic, which is one color, and then you have to change to a different color. That involves lots of waste in that transition process. So yeah. it's about simplifying things down and getting the the properties from fewer materials. It sounds like this would benefit society uh, a great deal. What are, the, what are the time frames? Do you think before we start to see this not just maybe being used for professional athletes and and in professional sports, but but for the you know wider general public? How, how far are we away from seeing metamaterials being a, an everyday solution? So, so, so metamaterials are are finding their way into sports products, and there are various products such as tennis rackets, helmets, running shoes, you know, bike saddles, which are sort of three D printed and made with metamaterials. Cool. I think we will start to see that increase. I would say within the next five to ten years. I mean, maybe five years we'll start to see them com- coming in more and being used more broadly. 10 years, we might start moving towards this sort of more circular economy that I've been talking about, where you have fewer materials and you're able to recycle them and bring them back into the into the metal material. So it sounds like this is not too far in the distant future. We we should be seeing these um, replacing some of the uh, the materials that we're, we're using, which aren't as perhaps eco-friendly as as we'd like them to be and that sounds like a a great opportunity not just for engineers but also for the ordinary person in the street so this is a great opportunity i guess to to encourage young people who are thinking of doing engineering to to maybe come into this field right yeah definitely and i mean it's always good to encourage you know young people to get into engineering this is an exciting area and it's an emerging area we're linking in you know really key technologies like 3D printing, modelling, testing, working with humans and and, and people. Yeah, it's a great area to be working in. Well, Tom, thank you ever so much for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show and and thank you for sharing your enthusiasm for for this particular area. And I'm really looking forward to getting my next pair of trainers that might have metamaterials in. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for this month. In next month's episode, we will be discussing the future of energy supply decarbonisation and what engineers are doing to address the challenges of energy storage, management and infrastructure of clean energy sources. You've been listening to Impulse to Innovation, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you, so if you'd like to share any news or any feedback with us, then please email us, podcast at imeke.org. All the information on this episode can be found in the episode notes.